Some cadets at the Air Force Academy were reading while they were lying in bed. And one of them was reading a story of the Second World War about an amazing hero named William Crawford. The Battle of the Bulls, trying to take Hill 224. And weaving in of that, this story was an amazing man who, remember the army, went behind the lines as a spy and came back reported and saved the lives of dozens and dozens of people and fought viciously. The military assumed he'd been killed. He received the Medal of Honor posthumously, and it was given to his dad. At the end of the war, amazingly so, William Crawford came out of the concentration camp and was alive, and he retired from the military service as a master sergeant in 1967. When these Air Force cadets read that, one of them said, isn't our janitor named William Crawford? We call him Pops, but could this be the same person? And so the next morning when he came in, they opened the book and said, here's a picture. Is this you? Did you win the Medal of Honor? Congressional Medal of Honor. And very modestly, he looked at the story and said, well, that just happened in a single day. Our scripture today is something like this. Because those cadets arranged that when President Ronald Reagan gave their final challenging address at their graduation, unknown to this janitor, this William Crawford, he received at that graduation firsthand, first time, the Medal of Honor from the President of the United States. Amazing story. Today in the Air Force Academy, the only member of the Army buried there is the same, William Crawford, a spy who fought bravely our scripture tells the story of something like that. Most of us, I think, are in the process of reading through the Bible chronologically. We've come to page, I believe, 347. We've gone through various eras in our reading. There's the era of creation, first part of Genesis, the era of the patriarchs, the era of Exodus, and now we're moving from the pulpit, at least, the era of conquest. But if you're reading chronologically, you're already ahead, beginning in Judges, and you've run into a guy named Boaz. Say that with me. Boaz. Say it again. Boaz. Hold on to Boaz. We're going to meet him just a little bit later. As we've been reading the Bible, you could start with Genesis and read through Revelation, and you'll discover something that may be very, very surprising. There is a theme that runs all the way through the Scripture. God does not run a short order type of religion. There's not a microwave process in which he is producing this world and a people in this world who can bring the message of true living into this world. Remember, he has taken the, the Israelites, he's taken the Jews, and he's building into them a new people as to how they relate to one another, how they relate to the government, how they relate to the family, how they relate to the culture, how they relate to all the world. They were to be the ambassadors of truth and my, how patient God is. Do you really know what the whole sweep of salvation history is saying? You'll never guess it. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who 
love the Lord. And those who are the call, those who are receive Christ, they're a part of his family. Love the Lord, are called according to his purpose. It means those who are seeking to follow the will and the plan of God for living. That's the whole purpose of Scripture, ladies and gentlemen. It's the most difficult verse to believe and the most magnificent verse when we believe it and understand it. Whatever happens in life, you say, well, you know, why wasn't there a little sign in the Garden of Eden that said, no snakes in the grass allowed? But there is suffering. There is heartbreak. And God doesn't always do things like you and I think they ought to take place. Have you noticed that? Let me ask you a question. Is anybody here wiser than God? Is anybody who's ever lived wiser than God? Don't you think God knows how we ought to live, we should live? Did you know that God loves you and loves me more than we love ourselves? Hello? Do you know that God understands you and understands me more than we understand ourselves? Do you know that God wants what is best for all of us more than we even want what is best for all of us in our own understanding? Can we understand that? You say, well, I don't understand suffering. God takes suffering. If you doubt it, look at the cross, the ultimate demonstration of evil, and he turns it into his glory and to his purpose. God is wiser than you are, wiser than I am, and God is always carrying out for us to get it, particularly the Israelites, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. Isn't that magnificent? And as we read through the Bible, that's the theme we need to hear and see and understand as he works in big panorama perspectives, as he works in very little narrow perspectives. His will, his plan, his glory for the world, for nations, for families, for individuals. And he's working through this massive scope. And we've looked at, if you've read it, we've looked at Joshua chapter number one. What's the theme of chapter one? They're about to go into the land of promise. They're about to go into Canaan. They're about to cross Jordan. They're about to go into the Holy Land. And what are they asking for? Four times, strength and courage, strength and courage. And then in that chapter, God tells them how they have strength and courage. You know what he says? He said, the Lord your God will be with you. <laughs> Listen, if the Lord your God and the Lord my God is with you and with me, can you ask for anything else? Is there any other? Well, Lord, I want to know this, that. No, 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 no. If the Lord our God is with you, you'll have plenty of strength and plenty of courage. That's what he's saying to the children of Israel before they go in and Conquer the land. And then here we have Joshua chapter 2. Man, we're in a sweep of history here and revelation and truth. And then all of a sudden, bang, it gets real personal. And we have just an intimate story that seems at first almost out of place. God's not just interested in the, oh, the overwhelming, but it tells us he's interested in every single person on the planet and who has ever been on the planet. Isn't that something? And we see the intimacy of Joshua chapter number two. And in this chapter, let me give you an advanced preview of what we're going to discover. We're going to discover that God uses unlikely people. 
And we're going to discover that God uses ordinary people, and we're going to discover that God uses unlikely ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Watch how it develops in an intimate story, beginning with verse 2. So they went and came to the home of the house of a harlot named Rahab. Beautiful spy story. You like mystery stories? Spy, spy. This is great. Joshua, before they go out in the land, he gets two young men to go out and spy out the land, they're on the other side of the Jordan now, haven't quite crossed over, and said, go discover what's going to happen, how we can conquer the land. Particularly look at all the land, but look especially at Jericho, because Jericho was right in front of them. You see, they had to take the city of Jericho in order to be militarily strategic, because Israel needed to go and cut the Holy Land in half, the north and the south, so they could not unite because all the government in that land was made up of city-states. In all these city-states, they had cities where they had kings and where they had government that controlled all of that area. And all over Israel, there was a multiplicity of city-states. And Joshua knew if he could split the country in half, they could deal with those city-states individually, and they would not come together and do battle against the children of Israel. Amazing strategy. So he gets two, strides, two spies to go out, and they're scouting out the land, and they go to Jericho, and they go into the house of a harlot, a prostitute named Rahab. She ran the best little chicken farm <laughs> in Jericho. If you had gone to Jericho, so archaeologists and anthropologists tell us, you would have found a whole epidemic of sexually transmitted disease, especially syphilis. And you can be sure in the whole Canaanite culture, if you study it historically, you see all the various crazy diversions they had in the whole area of sexuality. And we see this is happening in our culture. Amazing, staggering things are taking place. For example, I think it was in North Dakota this week, a 61-year-old woman gave birth using her gay son's seed and his male partner's egg that was given to them by his male partner sister. Now, this is a tragedy of our day and age, and we as a church, we cannot condone this because of biblical principles. We should not be in a pos uh, the posture of being an institution of condemnation. Therefore, those who are confused and have lost their way, a and what is the posture of the church? How are we to handle, to deal with, to confront, to love, to heal, to help? Remind you of something. Someone who is physically starving to death will many times eat unhealthy food. Let me say that again. Someone who is physically starving to death will eat unhealthy food. Someone who is emotionally starving to death will sometimes enter into unhealthy relationships. So we are to be a body that understands and loves and seeks to minister to and seeks to stand for the truth of God in Jesus Christ. Don't get into all. We're not in the condemning business. Those outside the church, this is just one element of it, they look upon us as the Bible is a book of hatred, 
A Bible is the book of condemnation. A Bible is the book of fire and brimstone. And we see this is the part, but primarily we'll learn that the church and the body of Christ is a place for love, not compromising biblical ethics, but a place of love because we know that salvation and redemption has taken place. If we visited the church of Corinth in the Bible, look what we would find in Corinth, and we must not forget this. It is found in 1 Corinthians. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not know that? He says, Do you not, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, not revelers, not extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And what's that say? And such were some of you. This body of Christ. We have hundreds of people, if not thousands, who've come out of dark, confusing places to the light and experience the love and the forgiveness and the grace of God. Isn't it magnificent that God can use a harlot like Rahab and use so many of us, and our message must be a stance for the truth of the power of God in Christ. When Jesus Christ comes into a life, he forgives he cleanses and he sets us free, and that is our message as the body of Christ, a place where we point people back to cleanliness and back to salvation. God uses a harlot like this, and people who've gone through dark valleys like many of us have and are going through uses unlikely people. He also uses ordinary people. Ordinary people. Here was this harlot Rahab, and evidently, by the way, if you read the story, she had a relationship with the king. Because when she told the story, if you read it in the Bible, that these two spies had come to her house, but they had gone out the gate, and evidently if they'd run and catch them, they were still fleeing, and they believed her. They did not search her house. She had street credibility. And we see that God uses unlikely and ordinary people. And when you read this scripture of what happened and what she believed and how she came to have a life that was powerfully used by the Lord, look at this passage, beginning with, with verse 12. Now, before they lay down, she came up to them to the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land huh, and that the terror of you has, taken, has fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the border, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Rahab said, neither did there remain any more courage in any of us because of you, for the Lord your God, he is the God of heaven above and the earth beneath. Do you see the knowledge that she had? She had street smarts, ordinary whore, ordinary prostitute running the, the house of prostitution there in that city. But look what she observed. She said, I know this land is yours. She knew the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They said, where did this land come from? Well, it was first of all given to Abraham and his kin. She knew who the land belonged to. Also, she knew about 
the drying up of the Red Sea when two million people came across it. You think you can keep that a secret? She said, man, I knew what, what happened there. And she said, I knew when you came into this area, the Amorites, Sahan and Og, those two kings, attacked you, and you obliterated them. You wiped them out. And she said, now we're all trembling here because we know what? We know that the Lord your God, get this, did you listen, is the God of heaven and the God of the earth. In other words, he is the real deal. Have you come to really believe that? Oh, yeah, I believe that. But a lot of us are like Paul talks about in 2 Timothy. He says, you spend all of your time hearing without coming to a knowledge of God. What does that mean? Oh, we want to hear more truth. We want to learn more Bible verses. We want to be preached to. We want to grow up. We need more information without taking all that we have heard and putting it into practice, living it out. That's the turning point. And here we see she had all this knowledge. Guess what? Everybody in Jericho had the same knowledge. <laughs> they knew who the land was entitled to. They knew about the dividing of the sea when two million came over. They knew about the defeat of the Amorites. They knew that this God was not one of their idols or impotent or powerless God. It was a true and living God of heaven and God of earth. They all knew that, but they did not respond. And here we see the faith of Ahab. She was ordinary. She had everything against her. Look at her. She was a woman. <laughs> the Jews prayed every day. Lord, I thank you that I am not a Gentile or a woman. They prayed that every day in the synagogue. They did. And women were chattel. They were, they were just owners. They could be thrown away. You could get a divorce in Israel if you didn't like the way the, I almost said bacon, the way the eggs were fried. With two witnesses, you could say, I'm out of here. I'm divorced from this woman. What a tar sorry cook that she is. And you see, women were nothing. And here she is, she's a woman. Oh, on top of that, she's a Canaanite. The Canaanites was ISIS of that day. That's the reason that God said, go in and wipe them all out, kill all of them. How are you going to live with ISIS, ladies and gentlemen? Do you know what they believe? You know what their philosophy? You can't live like this. It's like having, well, I'm going to live with this malignancy. You know, I'm just going to let it be a part of my body. Therefore, God said, you can't live with mad dogs who have lost their, their image of God, and they are no longer considered to be human. And that's what you have here. Man, she, had, she was a woman. She was a Canaanite. On top of that, she was a, she was a harlot, a prostitute running this business there in Jericho. Unlikely, ordinary. And then she enters into a covenant, a contract with Israel and with God. Look at this. It's found in verse 12. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have sworn by your kindness. By the way, when you see the word kindness in the Bible, it is always a blood covenant word. Remember how they would strike a blood covenant? They would take an animal, they would cut it into fours, and someone you would stand face to face and you'd walk around the halves in the blood of the animal and the person you were making a blood covenant with, they would walk around in the halves and you would meet in the middle, you would slice your wrist, they would slice their wrist, you'd tie the wrist together and that was now your blood brother. You would die for this person, you would, you would serve this person, that person has highest priority in your life. That was a covenant that was made between Israel and this harlot. And the deal was simply this, said, you will show us a true token 
give me a true token and spare my father and my mother. And you know what that true token was? It was a scarlet rope, the scarlet rope that she let them down the wall, her house of prostitution. There were two walls in Jericho, an inner wall. There was a high wall, probably 30 feet high, about the height that Trump wants to build on our southern border about 30 feet high. There was an outer wall that was not as high, not as well fortified. There were about 15 feet between them. She lived on the outer wall. That's where her house of prostitution was. Now she enters into agreement. She knows they're going to go and take over that city and destroy everything in it. And she says, I want you to spare me and spare my family, and there needs to be a token. And the token was a scarlet rope that would be hanging out of the window. So when the children of Israel attacked Jericho, they would spare her house with all of her family in it. They would look at that scarlet rope. Let me show you how the, the best little chicken farm in Texas would look actual picture if they had a scarlet rope hanging out of it. I want you to see it. The rope of salvation, the rope of the cleansing blood of Christ. You see, the door was open to all the Canaanites. They had all the facts, but they didn't respond. She had the facts, and the most unlikely person, ordinary person, responded, and she found salvation through the blood arrangement. Remember, you read the passage carefully. It says, this doesn't happen. It'll cost me my life. It didn't happen. It'll cost you your life. And they made this blood pack, and the token that was given was that scarlet, scarlet rope hanging out the window, which talked of redemption. And look at the extraordinary thing that happened. I've got to take you there. The sixth chapter of Joshua, I've got to take you there. Now, here's two million of the Israelites. They were ready to go across the river. They were about, oh, just seven miles, probably from Jericho, across the river, ready to go in. And they had 600,000 armed soldiers. By the way, all two million could fight. How big a, a, an army was that if they had two million? You know, the largest standing army in the world today is the army of China. They'd have got about 2,200,000. The second largest standing army today is the army in India, a little less than that. The third is the army of the United States. We're way down the line in number. And then comes North Korea. So you see, this was a formidable body of people. And so now they go and they give clear instructions. By the way, how clear do we find the details, the rules, the instructions, the procedure that God gave to Joshua in starting to take care of and look after and, and make out of his peculiar people a holy people committed unto him that understood their message and their purpose in life? Look at all the signals and signs. It's amazing to read the, the birth of a nation under God, holy, separate, surrendered to him. So we now we see they're ready to go in. And look at the procedure. First of all, they have the armed soldiers, not all of them. And then behind the armed soldiers, they have seven priests who are carrying trumpets. It's very important, the trumpet that they were carrying. Don't miss this. They were not carrying a silver trumpet. A silver trumpet was the trumpet they used primarily to blow the shofar, and that would be a call to battle. It would be a call to a, a ceremonial service. They would use the silver trumpet. But here, these priests, ready to march around Jericho, they had the horns. They had the ram's horn, and they had what was called the jobel, it was the horns they used for the year of Jubilee. Follow me. What was the year of Jubilee? 
It came every 49 years in which there'd be a new beginning. All debts would be forgiven. Everybody would be liberated from prison. All slaves would be set free. The year of Jubilee. And they use the ram's horn only to shout the year of Jubilee. And these priests were carrying the ram's horn, not the shofar horn, not the silver horn, to call you into battle. What does that mean? They were marching not to victory, but they were marching from victory. The victory had already taken place. God had already decided the outcome. And so they were ready to blow the horn which would inaugurate the year of Jubilee, which would be God's people possessing the promised land. Very important. The military is marching. The priests, seven of them, very important, seven, seven, 49, 49 years, year of Jubilee, all the math in here is so significant. And then behind them was the Ark of the Covenant, which to them was the presence of God himself. And behind them was another group of soldiers. And the first day, follow me, can you imagine? Here is Jericho, frightened, locked up, all gates down, trembling, and here comes the Israelites, and there's total silence. The soldiers are marching around the city in silence. The priests have the trumpets to their side in silence, and they march around the whole city the first day in silence with the Ark of the Covenant and the other soldiers bringing up the rear silence. Started at daybreak when the sun came up. Can you imagine? How would you feel if you were a Canaanite in Jericho? Knowing what they knew. Remember, they all had a chance to get out. They all had a chance to turn. They all had a chance to do what Ray had, but they didn't. You see, they had the knowledge. They had the hearing, but they hadn't incorporated into it by the act of faith going out that gate. First, second day, same thing. Soldiers, trumpets quiet, Ark of the Covenant, soldiers marched around the city, total silence. Third day, same group, marched around the city, total silence. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and the seventh day, Joshua said, when I give you the signal, let the trumpets sound the day of Jubilee and let all the people just a few miles away, two million of them, shout. Who? Just <laughs> here in the city. And now all of a sudden, the trumpet sound. Wow. Two million people shout, 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 shout. And they're marching around the city and the walls come down. You say, well, I don't know, and this is a very prominent area of earthquakes. Three different archaeologists have said the walls caved inward. I don't know about all that. You have a problem with that supernatural. Go back, how in the world did they crit across the Red Sea? Would you tell me that? How in the world did they feed to me? We already see the miraculous hand of God working in these people, and the walls coming down, that's no big deal. And all the walls came down. You could see them flat on the ground, except, except there's one little section on the outer wall there, a little, little house, and, 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 and that, that's, that's the Rahab's chicken farm house, and, and, and it's still standing. Everything else is flat. And, and look out the window, <laughs> out the window. There's a, a purple rope, a purple rope. They didn't know how she was going to be saved, how this would work. They didn't know. I don't believe the walls were going to fall down. But they saw that rope, and then we read later on in the sixth chapter that they went in and they took out Rahab and her father and her mother and all that were secure in that house. What happened to Rahab? What happened to Rahab? Now she was outside, and then she became a proselyte. She became a, an Israeli, and she married a prominent Jewish man, and they had a boy named 
Boaz. And there we have Rahab along with two other very sexually confused women in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the royal lineage you find in Matthew through Joseph, and you have Tamar and Bathsheba and Rahab. So when you see on television, I want to trace my genealogy, www. Boy, wouldn't it be something to be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? If you're in Christ, you're in that genealogy. <laughs> a little dusty village in Brazil, a little poor, poor family had a daughter named Christina. Christina was young teenager, bright, beautiful, bouncy, dancing, brown eyes. She was restless. She kept talking about Rio. I want to go to Rio. I don't want to stay in this little village and be poor. I want to go to Rio. That's where the action is. That's where the romance is. I want to go to Rio. So one morning, her mother Maria went in and her pallet was vacant and she knew that somehow during the night that her daughter Christina had gotten up and had headed for Rio. This mother panicked. She went and packed what she needed, got all the money she had, went down and bought a bus ticket and went to the little store there where they had the little photography booths where you could take pictures. And she went in, this mother, took picture after picture of herself until she ran out of money. She had a stack of black and white pictures of herself and she put them in her purse. She got her bag and she headed for Rio. She didn't know where to look for her wayward daughter, so she took pictures of herself, this mother, and put them on bulletin boards and motels and, and hotels and brothels and houses of prostitution in little stores and anywhere she thought maybe her daughter would see her picture. She did this for weeks until she ran out of money and ran out of pictures. She couldn't find Christina in the big city of Rio. And so she got on a bus and cried all the way back to the interior, all the way back home. Months go by. Then one day, Christina is coming down the steps from a brothel. Her eyes no longer dance. She's no longer really cute and beautiful as she was. She looked older, older than her years. And she was a beaten up young lady, confused, in pain, wanting to go back home to her little pallet in the village rather than the multiplicity of, of dirty people and dirty beds she'd been with those months. But she had too much pride, and she went down those steps, and she happened to look at a bulletin board, and she looked again, and there was a picture of her mother. And she went and took that picture off the bulletin board and turned it over, and on the back it read, whatever you've done, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Come home. And she did. Our Heavenly Father, oh, how easy it is for us to get lost away from home or even in the middle of our homes. And Lord, how many here today need to simply come home and come to Jesus Christ, experience a clean new beginning, knowing that you use unlikely people and ordinary people to do extraordinary, miraculous things. Lord, we count on that scarlet thread of redemption and salvation in all of our lives. Use us today, we pray in Jesus' name.